Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome. We're going to be starting here in just a moment. Um, Tommy's just getting a little situated. Tommy, you good to go here? Yeah, I think I'm ready, Pete. All right. Uh, let's send it on over to Tommy. All right. So like Pete said, I'm Tommy. I'm one of the techs here at Stumac. I answer all the pedal and wiring and amp questions, um, among other things. Here today with me is our co-host Pete Esau, and we've got our videographer Rachel here. It's going to get some great close-up uh, shots of whatever I'm talking about. Um, so, like I said, this is a like Pete said, this is a live pedal build that we're going to do. This intro is going to be mostly informative. We're not really going to dig in much today, but we're going to go over what comes in the kit, uh, what kind of pedal it is. We're going to go over some of my tips and tricks for soldering. And we're going to talk about finishing the pedal, which is another really cool way to customize it and kind of make it your own, um, own your tone. Which uh, pedal are we building today? So we're building the Interval Fuzz. Um, comes with this fun graphic. It's got no knobs or controls or any of any kind. There's no trim pots or anything like that. Um, it's just an on off button and essentially what it is is an analog octave up pedal interval meaning octave up um, it's based loosely around the Dan Armstrong green ringer uh, which is a ring mod pedal uh, it's a really cool circuit it's also a very simple circuit a great first project if you've never done electronics and what we're going to talk about today is really universal and it applies pretty broadly to every kind of electronics project you're going to be working on. If you're new to soldering, there's going to be some great stuff in here. If you're not, there might still be some neat stuff that you may not have seen before. Um, so we're going to go through all that. Um, before we get into that, uh, can you show us what the pedal can do? Sure. Yeah, we can do a quick demo. So this pedal sounds different depending on the type of pickups you have depending on your pick attack and depending on where on the neck you're playing. Um, so I have a, a guitar here with our kind of PAF style uh, vintage wound humbuckers. Um, not crazy high output or anything like that. So you can hear my clean tone. I'm playing through a, one of our Stumac Princeton kits. Now you can hear it with the pedal. So you can hear that, that second note above your original note is what they mean by that analog octave up. So you can see when I hit that button, it adds that second note and a bunch more texture. Another great thing about this pedal is it stacks really well with other pedals, distortion pedals, fuzz pedals. If you put it in front of those in your signal chain, um, the, the interval fuzz will still track properly as far as giving you the right octave. Uh, and then it will push your next pedal, whether that be a fuzz or overdrive, into different harmonic territory. And that's kind of what the Octavia pedal was all in one pedal. So I have kind of a medium drive setting on this uh, Caroline distortion. So that's with the interval fuzz. And you can hear, if I play more than one note at a time, it really starts to break up and gets into some pretty crazy territory. So we can hear that. And that's what we call that ring modulation effect. Essentially, it doesn't know which note to pick, so it goes between them and creates other dis like clipping and distortion. So, Tommy, what um, you know, you said it's great uh, in conjunction with a distortion pedal here. Um, how does it really sound, you know, across the board? 
you so, get those humbuckers, but uh, yeah, so it really does sound different with single coil pickups. It's a little smoother. Um, if you play kind of seventh fret and up single notes, it's going to track really well. It's going to sound, it can sound downright pretty. If you play chords, it's going to sound kind of, kind of weird. Because again, it doesn't know which note to track. The further down the neck you get back towards the nut, it's going to sound weirder and weirder because it's out of the range where the harmonic content is going to sound good. So. Also, if you play an octave on the guitar, it's going to sound weird. So it really is a circuit designed to be played kind of on single notes. It's great for kicking in in a solo. And it's really great to throw in um, if you've already got another distortion that's turned on. So now this is with the neck, uh, the bridge pickup. So it really tracks better with the neck pickup. And if you guys want to see more demos, uh, we can do more of that. Leave us a comment if you want to see it with different pickups, if you want to see it uh, with different instruments. It sounds really cool on bass. Um, it sounds really cool on keyboards too because there's so much harmonic content that it really sends the pedal into otherworldly territory. Nice. All right. Um, let's take a look at the pedal. What comes with the kit? Yeah, so the kit comes with everything you need, uh, aside from tools. Um, we've got it all laid out here in this neat little tray, um, but you get your choice of enclosure. So we've got a gray enclosure and a white enclosure. Um, the gray one's great if you're gonna paint your own. Um, the white one is great if you wanna kinda just hit the ground running and not have to worry too much about finishing. Um, and again, we'll talk more in depth about finishing at the end of this video. So the kit comes with the custom sticker, um, which looks really cool on the white or a painted enclosure. Um, it, it is clear, so you don't want to go too dark. Um, and then it's got all these components and wire. Um, basically what you need, aside from what comes in the kit, is a good soldering iron. Um, you could probably get away with a 40 watt iron, but we really recommend you, get a, you have a good iron for this. You want to have control of your heat, you want to be able to get nice and hot. It really can make the difference between a really fun experience and a frustrating experience. Um, you definitely need solder, obviously. I personally really like to have a good PC board holder. Um, this is one that Stumac sells. Um, they're available online. And this is great because during this kit, you're going to be flipping your work back and forth um, once you load a component, you flip it over to solder it. And something like this is great to hold it securely so you have both your hands to work with and so you can just position it in whatever way is best for you. Um, we really recommend you have something to remove solder as well because inevitably there will be um, something that you need to go back and fix. This is our solder sucker. Um, I personally am a big fan of these. You can also get a solder wick, which is essentially just a copper braid um, that removes solder from a joint. It's good to have a good pair of wire clippers, uh, strip, I mean, sorry. Um, the wire in this kit is 24 pre-bond, 24 gauge. Um, so you need a stripper that's going to go down at least to 24 gauge wire. Really good to have flush cutters, um, for nipping those leads off once they go through the board. Um, that, that's a really good one to have to make your work look nice and tidy. What, uh, what kind of support is available here for the kit? So at any point in this kit, you can get support by emailing service at stumac.com. You can also contact us in, through the website. Um, we have free tech support. If anything doesn't seem to be working right, or if you lose a component, or if you, something breaks, uh, we're happy to replace it. Just, just let us know. Um, and can we take a look at the instructions too? Yeah. So 
So that's another part of this kit that I really like. I've built other pedal kits, but this one um, really shines because of the instructions. Um, they're full color on the website. Um, you can download them for free. You can either have them on a big iPad or print them off. Um, I like to have something physical in my hand. But you can see they're great full color. They go through all the tools you're gonna need. And again, all the tools I list and talk about tonight, if you miss anything, this video is gonna stay up on our YouTube channel. So if you miss anything, you can come back or if you wanna see something again, if it wasn't clear what I said, um, leave us a comment. We're happy to, we're happy to go over it next week. Cause again, we're gonna do this a few weeks in a row till we're all done. You can see in these instructions, it, it's got great graphics, shows you what everything is kind of idealized. Um, it's, it's really nice to have. It goes through some tips and tricks for good soldering. Um, and again, it's just a step-by-step best layout kind of deal. Um, and again, um, not every kit comes with, with great instructions, but these are, these are about the best I've seen for sure. And if people don't have their kit yet, we're really going to get down to the nitty gritty next week. Right. And so, yeah, so, so this week we'll go through, um, everything that comes in the kit, what we're going to be doing. We'll go over soldering and then we'll get into finishing. You still have time to pick one up. Um, and generally we ship, you know, it orders placed before, I believe two o'clock will go out the same day. Um, we're still shipping. So, so if you get your order placed um, within the next, you know, day or so, you probably have it in time uh, to join in next week when we start really getting down to the nitty gritty. Um, so what, what else? Okay, tools. We talked about all that. It's good to have a screwdriver. We have a screwdriver set. I don't know if you want to get a, Shot of that, Rachel. Oh, yeah. It's got everything you could possibly need and more. Um, I like to have also our soldering aids. These things are just a lifesaver, especially if you do repairs. But these are really great if you need to push something into place or just adjust a lead or something, and it's too small to work with with your fingers. Because um, as you can see, a lot of these components are just minuscule components and it's tough to get in there with your fingers. So it's really nice to have some soldering aids. Um, and then, oh, a multimeter. It's really great to have a good multimeter. If you're troubleshooting, if you just want to make sure that a joint you just made is good, um, this thing is your best friend. I always have my multimeter nearby whenever I'm doing any type of soldering. And, uh, for those of us who may need some, you know, some glasses who don't have the best eyesight. Yeah, yeah, good call. The Optivisor is my personal favorite. Um, if you don't have great studio lighting like we have, we have one that comes with a light. You really need good lighting too, because um, seeing what you're doing is very important, but some type of magnification is really gonna help you ensure that you are inspecting your work as you go and getting good solder joints all the way. Um, so this is, this is my personal favorite. Yeah. Um, so you had mentioned solder, but, uh, can we take a look at the iron too? Yeah. So I'm using our Solomon station. It's a digital station with a fine point tip. I really recommend a fine point tip. You don't want, uh, a chisel tip or anything like that. These, these joints need to be small and precise. Um, so you don't need to go crazy with like a needle tip. But this tip is just about perfect for this kind of project. Can you catch that, Rachel? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So you don't wanna, you don't have an old tip. Uh, so if your tip's kind of old and getting oxidized, you wanna get a replacement for that. And then I think the last thing is something to clean. Um, you need to clean your tip as you go. You need to make sure it's properly tinned and we have a couple options. We have this uh, Stay Hot Tip Cleaner. It's basically brass coils that remove gunk and oxidization from your tips. You can see how that looks nice and shiny now, Rachel. Oh yeah. Yeah, so once it gets hot, that brass, those brass coils will pull any of that dirt and debris off of there. The old standby, and my personal favorite, is just a damp sponge. You want a damp, not wet sponge. Most soldering irons will come with a sponge. 
or a place to put a sponge. Again, you don't want it to be sopping wet, just damp enough to steam some of that gunk off. All right. Um, I think we should uh, get to some soldering tips. Yeah. So again, this is kind of universal. It applies to any type of electronics project um, to a point. But what we're going to talk about is really good information for anybody who's just new at soldering. Or if this is your first pedal kit, we're going to talk about my tips and tricks for getting good solder joints with these specific kinds of boards. But again, this is kind of the fundamentals of soldering, if you will. And again, if there's anything anyone wants more specifics on, please do leave us a comment. Yeah, we'll definitely. Uh, and subscribe because we are going to do a few of these and um, it'll be, be great if we could get some people subscribed. So basically what we've got is metal components through a little metal eyelet. These are called all these little metal rings here. Can you see those, Rachel? I don't know that screen just for a second. All these little metal rings are called eyelets. Now this is a different circuit board, but this is just for instruction and demonstration. Um, all of our pedal kits come like this with a custom PCB that's fully labeled. And it also has all these little eyelets here. And essentially you're feeding a component leg through the eyelet and connecting them with the solder. Um, you're, you're melting the solder to create a strong electrical connection between the component and the circuit. It's pretty basic stuff. Right. Now, something I mentioned before is tinning your tip, super important. You need to make sure your tip is conducting properly so I don't know if, Rachel, you want to get a close-up of the tinning process. It also is outlined. Yeah, it also is outlined. Can you see that? In the instructions, it goes through tinning and why it's important. But well, basically... Can, yeah, can you tell us why it's important? Yeah, it helps you your iron conduct the heat properly through the tip because this whole thing is smoking hot, but you really need the heat to be focused. So you get a little bit of uh, flux on there, a little bit of solder on there and then just roll it off. You don't need too much. Again, you're not gonna hurt anything if you put too much on, it's just wasteful. And then when you wipe it off, then you end up with a nice shiny surface and that's gonna conduct the heat just how you need it to. And you mentioned flux, what, what exactly is flux? Flux is just a part of the solder. It cooks off once you heat, um, once you actually heat the solder. Okay. All right, so and, then, like uh, I said, we you really want a good hot iron. I have mine set for about 370 Celsius or 700 Fahrenheit. Um, some irons list it differently. Um, but again, you, you really want to get a nice hot iron for a project like this. You want to apply high heat for a very short amount of time so you don't damage the circuit board or damage the components. Um, and how often do you find yourself tinning the tip? So I clean my tip every two or three joints. Um, and again, you can use a, a wet, wet sponge or the that's tip cleaner. And then I tin my tip probably every one or two minutes. For a kit like this, the instructions go through and have you load your components in batches. So I find that I can generally tin my tip at the beginning of a batch and then get that whole batch soldered without really needing to tin it again. Um, again, I have a lot of experience soldering, but I really do think a, a beginner can, can get this if they can just follow the, those basic fundamentals. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is there anything you recommend keeping an eye out for, something that might tip someone off that the actual tip needs tinned again? Yeah, so anytime it starts to look dark, anytime you can see residue, uh, whether that be from touching a, a stray wire or a different component. Some of these have plastic housings that can melt and get on your iron. Um, anytime you see anything other than a nice, shiny, smooth surface, you should first clean your tip. And then if it still doesn't look quite shiny, uh, you should tin it. Again, there's no harm in tinning your tip. Um, it's just it can be wasteful if you're overdoing it. Cool. So, um can yeah, what's up, Pete? I was going to say, let's let's get to soldering yeah. one of these here. So again, all these components come in the kit, and then what you're going to need to do to get them 
into place is bend these legs so that they can go into the board. So it's a great shot of that, right? Great. So then I just bend them pretty much as close to the body of that component as I can. This one being a resistor. And again, this is just a demo board, so I'm just going to put it wherever I want. But when you go through the steps, all the graphics are going to show you exactly where everything goes and in, in what orientation, if that matters. Some components it does, some it doesn't. So again, if you can see that, Rachel, I've got my legs bent, and then I've just line them up with the eyelet that I'm going for, and it should just go right through. I like to give it a little pull when it's lined up. And you want just as good as you can to get flush against the board. So you can see that's got a nice low profile. There's not a whole lot of conductor. Sometimes I'll see photos from customers and the, the conductor itself is all looped around. It can cause shorts. It can just cause all sorts of problems. Also, those legs act as little antenna. So you might end up with an overly noisy circuit. And uh, when you say a short, what exactly happens with a short? A short circuit, meaning your signal is going somewhere you don't want it to go. Um, it, it's pretty, pretty common that somebody has no signal going through their pedal, and it's just two leads touching that shouldn't be touching. Um, so then I've got my, my, my component loaded into my board. I pull these legs out to hold it in place because, again, when it's upside down, it wants to fall out. So you pull those out, I've got my iron nice and hot, I tin my tip so it's nice and shiny. You wanna apply heat to the eyelet and component for about four seconds. This is a ballpark, everyone has their own favorite tips and tricks, but I'm just gonna show you here, I'm gonna go in on this bottom one. Two, three, four. And then see, feed the solder to the joint, not to the iron and leave your iron on there for about another second. It'll cook off what we were talking about before, flux. Um, and essentially it'll just make sure everything's heated evenly. And I'm gonna get my Optivizer on, but I believe that's a pretty good looking joint there. Yeah, what's, uh, I guess, what's the overall goal here? What, what should you be looking for for a successful joint? Yeah, so you want, and this is a good example here. I don't know if you've got a good close up of that, Rachel. Yeah far out. So you want it to be nice and shiny all the way around. You don't want any gaps between the eyelet and the component. And you don't want it to be overly bulbous. If you have too much solder on there, it's really easy to create a, an accidental cold joint. A cold joint is one that just hasn't flowed properly. And if you end up with a cold joint, it's gonna look cloudy, it may look cracked, it's not gonna look smooth and shiny like this. And your best bet is to remove that solder and just do it again. Um, cold joints may even look fine, but they're not gonna conduct energy properly um, or conduct electricity properly. So I'm gonna do this other one just as another demo here if you wanna get it again, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Again, we go in one, two, three, four, and then get that solder in there and I just leave it on there for another second to make sure it melts all the way around. Again, that's not super complicated. If you can follow those instructions, you can really build this pedal kit. Um, and again, if you, have, if you have questions or if you wanna see anything again, um, like we said, this video will stay on YouTube and you can also leave us a comment saying, hey, we wanna see more about that or, you know, we don't want to see so much about that. Yeah, if we get enough questions before the next video, maybe we can address some of them at the yeah, beginning. Yeah, for sure. So, and then as far as solder, I would really recommend you use 6040 solder. Um, you can buy all, all types of different solder, but 6040 is pretty much what the pros use, and it really is your best bet for a kit like this. It just melts properly, and it, I... I just have never had a problem with it. And when you say 60-40, what, what exactly does that mean? Uh, tin to lead. So 60% tin, 40% lead. They sell lead-free solder, but I really just, I, I've never had good luck with it. Um, so I, I really would recommend, if you're not gonna get all these tools, 
at least pick up a decent iron and some good 60-40 solder for sure. All right. Um, let's see. Did you already clip those off there? We yeah, that? but I can show you again. Um, I can just solder another one up here real quick. Yeah. Can we see just one more time how you like to bend that? And yeah. Then, so uh, again, I just hold one side of the component, bend that as well as I can, and then do the other side. With this kit, you're not really going to worry too much about if it gets crowded because it's a much simpler circuit than some of our other ones. But again, I just get those legs fed through. I just push it down as far as I can get it. Shouldn't need to force it really. And then I pull those leads back. So that's gonna stay in place. I'm gonna tin my tip again, just cause it's been a minute. And like I said, just a couple seconds, four seconds usually does the trick. And again, that's a good solder joint. So I have a lot of experience soldering and I still make mistakes. Don't feel bad if you're not making perfect joints right at the beginning. Practice makes perfect just like anything else. So now that I've got them created, I go through and generally I'll do my whole batch and then clip all my leads at the same time. But I've got my little flush cutters here and I just get as close as I can. You don't need to go crazy. You don't want to damage the actual joint. You just want to get as much of that extra leg off of there as you can get. If you have all these leads left over at the end, they can cause, like we said before, shorts cause all sorts of problems. All right. Um, let's take a look at, uh, you know, the actual kind of flow of building the kit. Um, you know, how do you keep everything straight with so many tiny, tiny parts? So for our purposes for this video, we're going to have it in this nice tray. Um, I, and I'm familiar enough with these components that I can identify them as far as what is they are, what they are and what they do. The instructions go through everything, and I really recommend that when you get your kit, you check that all the parts are there and that they're all correct, and then also organize them. Um, this can be something like this. It could be as simple as a piece of cardboard with all the different values written. And again, all those values are referenced in the instructions. Um, but when I, when I build one at home, I have generally a, a nice piece of paper or a piece of cardboard and I write all the different resistor values and the different capacitor values. Generally, if there are other components, they're pretty easy to tell apart. Um, but the resistors really can be a bear to identify while you're going. So it's a good idea to have those organized as well as you can ahead of time. Staying organized is really gonna help you avoid frustration when you're building this kit, because really it should be fun. Nice, uh, can we take a look at some of the different parts? You mentioned different yeah. resistors, capacitors. Yeah, so I don't know if Rachel, if you've got a decent shot of all this. Yeah, and you could throw some up on the little coaster. Yeah, right so through. what we've got on the coaster here is a resistor. In these kits, they're pretty much all gonna be blue, or some shade of blue. You can see they vary a bit in size. That's their wattage rating. Not important to know that. It's just important to know this is what a resistor looks like. And these tiny little color bands are what tell you the component's value, how much resistance it has. So that's incredibly important for a kit like this that you get those in the right spot. Um, and that's what we're gonna really dig into next week is identifying those, and getting them in the proper order. Hey, Tommy, we've got a pretty good question here cool. from Sassy Cat. Um, how do you know what part makes what sound? That is a good question, Sassy Cat. Um, no individual part is going to make a, a sound on its own outside of some really complicated digital circuits. 
Um, these all have to work together to create that octave up. Um, if, you, if you're into reading schematics, um, you can start to kind of learn how they all interact, how they, how they control the voltage that's coming in and create these super interesting effects that we all know and love. Um, but to answer your question, none of them make their own sound on their own. But like, like I was saying, this one is a diode. It's got a band on one end. I don't know if you can see that, how it's orange all the way through and there's a black band. That allows signal to pass in one direction only. Um, so it really matters which way you install it, which direction. And again, it's fully laid out in the instructions. We'll get into that next week as well. That's another example of a diode. We've also got capacitors. We've got a couple different kinds of capacitors. They do different things, but generally they're used to store voltage and to stop DC voltage from passing and allow AC voltage to pass. Again, this is all electronic jargon that you don't really need to know to build this pedal, but some basic knowledge is good to know, especially if you're getting into electronics. There's tons of valuable resources out there if you want to learn about electronics and what different components are designed to do. Tommy, we got another question here uh, from Ronald Rump. Are there any components or country of origin to avoid? Not really. Um, there, are, there are a ton of different components manufacturers, but the components in this kit are all pretty good stuff. It's all kind of standard. Um, none of them are lousy by any means. They're good switches. Um, the, the things that are going to fail in a low quality kit generally are your switches and your pots. Um, this comes with really good 3P DT, um, three triple pole double throw switches. It comes with switchcraft jacks. And this one doesn't have any pots, so you don't really need to worry about that. Um, but essentially, um, this kit as is, is a solid kit value-wise and component value-wise. All right. Um, so, you know, we mentioned the instructions slightly before, or, you know, in passing before. Where can you find them? Um, yeah, so all of our pedal kit instructions are available for free uh, at stumac.com. For this one, you can search for interval fuzz on our website, um, or you can just punch in the item number 2354, um, and that'll take you to the, the product page, and there's a link on that page, the right side about halfway down for the instructions. Uh, and again, they're available as a PDF, so if you've got a nice tablet or something, that works great, just propped up on your bench, um, or you can print them off like we have um, again, I'm kind of old fashioned. I like to have the, the paper copy so I can lay a bunch of things out at once um, and not stare at a screen more than I already do. Yeah, I, I think um, let's go into that a little more. What kind of uh, workflow or how do you like to, you know, set up your workspace? Any good tips for people out there? Yeah, so I like to make sure I'm comfortable because if you're hunched over, or if you're too hot or whatever, if you can't see properly, you're gonna make mistakes and you're not gonna have fun. Um, so that's why I really like to have something like this. Uh, you can use just a, a vise. There's all sorts of different solutions, um, but I really like this PC board holder. I've used this to build amp everything from an amplifier to a pedal to just a, a, little, a little circuit I made. Um, so something like this is really good. I like to have that square in front of me my meter, my soldering iron within reach, but not right in my way, because um, you can you can accidentally burn yourself if you're not paying attention. Uh, I like to have all my tools within arm's reach, um, but I really want to have my my board right in front of me and all my components organized and laid out, so it's easy for me to find the one I'm looking for. Nice. Um, you know we kind of touched on finishing the cases or the enclosure before, but uh, let's go a little deeper into that. Yeah, so we've got some cool examples. Um, this is one that 
we did a cool trade secrets for that's going to be coming out soon with hydrographic film. Um, there's tons of different prints that you can find out there for this type of film. Super easy. You can do it in just an hour or so. And again, we'll have a, a really neat video with that coming out soon. Um, this is also that same film, Rachel, if you want to see that one. Mm -hmm. So again, there's tons of different graphics that you can find. Um, and it generally comes in a roll like this. Um, and as you can see, pretty thin, easy to cut. It's just really fun stuff to work with. Um, so that's a great option if you're not feeling artistic, um, or even if you are. Personally, I always paint my pedals. Um, standard, uh, any spray paint designed for metal is going to do a good job. If you're going to paint it, I recommend you do the bare enclosure. Um, this, you can just sand it with maybe some 220 sandpaper, remove any kind of blemishes or bumps or humps, and then get to spraying. Um, generally, I do two or three coats um, on, on my color, and then I follow that with two or three coats of clear just to protect it. Um, and you do want to, you spray the top and back separately. And uh, at what stage in the build do you recommend going with the... You, you know, can do it whenever you want. I recommend you do it before your circuit is complete. So it's really a bummer to get all the way done and then realize that you still didn't paint your enclosure, but you're supposed to install the power jack. So then you have to stop and go get paint and go spray your pedal. Um, if you're not into spraying it, you can get the white enclosure. It looks great with the sticker on it. You can, you can customize these. I've seen people uh, paint with acrylic on these. Um, it, it looks great just with the sticker. Do you want to see that? Yeah, let's see that. Toss that sticker on there. So again, these are little vinyl stickers that come with the pedal. It's got a sticker for the logo, and it's also got a sticker for the jacks, just so you don't end up plugging it in backwards. But these are super easy to apply. And then once the stickers are on, it's once good to go. Once the stickers are on, I still would shoot it with clear to protect it. These stickers are going to hold up pretty well, but inevitably they will get snagged on something in your gig bag or your dog will chew on it or whatever. Um, and so these, <laughs> a cool thing you can do with these is use Sharpie. Um, Sharpie will adhere to these. It's just got to dry for a second. So this being an interval fuzz octave up, I'm going to just draw the Roman numerals for eight on here just because I think I'm funny. Eight, eight octave. Octave means eight notes above. I see. So... Again, this is just a standard Sharpie you could get anywhere. And it does end up looking pretty cool. I'm terrible at drawing. That's why I usually spray paint them. And I'm going to spray one this weekend um, that we'll show you next week. And it really does, you know, even if you're not great at spray painting, you can end up with a pretty professional looking job. I see a ton of really neat stuff that our customers have done either with film or paint or combinations. Um, it just really, the sky's the limit and your only real boundary is your creativity. Um, and again, if you're not feeling super creative, get the white one, smack some Sharpie on there. Again, I, I feel like it looks pretty cool on its own just as a white with that cool custom graphic. All right. Um, so yeah, you said you're gonna finish one this weekend. Yeah, I'm gonna take this one home. And I'm going to spray it. I have a cool light blue that I found at just the local hardware store. So I'm going to spray one, and we'll slap the stickers on there next week. Um, but again, if you haven't got one, you still have time to join in. Next week, we're really going to get uh, down and dirty and start soldering our components. We're really going to start building this pedal kit. Um, please leave us questions, comments, subscribe to our channel. Um, this is the first ever time we've ever tried anything like this. 
So we really do want your feedback and we'd love to keep making these if you guys are into it. So again, um, this is the interval fuzz. The item number is 2354 at stumac.com. And let's see, did I miss anything, Pete? Uh, I think you really covered most of what we're looking at. Are there any more questions? Uh, you know what? I think Sassy Cat um, has a little bit of clarification here on their question. Um, they wanted to know, how do you know what grouping of components you need to build a fuzz versus a chorus or you know, so on? Yeah, so the cool thing about these pedals is they all kind of use the same components. They just use them different ways to affect the circuit. So a lot of chorus pedals, you'll see an integrated chipset or something like that that's not going to be included in this kit. But essentially, these are the basic building blocks for literally every guitar effects pedal out there. Resistors, diodes, caps, transistors. That's 90% of what you're going to see in a pedal kit, especially in a fuzz kit. And you said uh, the chorus would have an IC? So an integrated circuit chip is a bunch of, a bunch of different connections inside a little chip that is essentially a smaller version of what you're building, but it would be way too many connections and too small to fit in the same space. Um, okay. so, so again, those are, those are like the common chips you hear about that are in a tube screamer or are in a clon or are in a rat distortion pedal. Um, again, they're not in this pedal, but they are included in a few of, uh, quite a few of our other pedals. Delay pedals often use uh, IC chip as well, just because there's so much more going on than you can do with simple analog point-to-point -point wiring. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, looks like that's really all the questions we have for now. Cool. Again, please leave us your questions, comments, and we'd be happy to address them. Yeah. So until next week, we'll be back uh, next week, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, um, live on YouTube. I'd like to thank Rachel, our videographer. Thank you, Rachel. Wow. I'd really like to thank Pete, helping me steer the ship here. Again, my name's Tommy. Please leave us a comment. Y'all have a great week.